Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Brittany Barco, and I'm the Senior Director of Development for Rutgers Biomedical Health Sciences. With me is Melissa McKillop, Vice Dean for Advancement, School of Environmental and Biological Sciences at Rutgers New Brunswick. We thank you all for attending the virtual Rutgers Big Idea event, Global Wellness and Human Health, the Rutgers University Microbiome Program. Today, we are honored to have with us four renowned microbiome experts, Dr. Martin Blazer, Dr. Maria Gloria Dominguez Bello, Dr. Li Ping Zhao, and Dr. Devashish Bhattacharya, who will introduce you to the Rutgers University Microbiome Program, a first of its kind comprehensive and multidisciplinary program here at Rutgers, as well as their novel microbiome research initiatives that aim to restore and promote the well being of humans, animals, plants, and ecosystems to improve overall global wellness. Dr. Martin Blazer is the director of the Center for Advanced Biotechnology and Medicine and holds the Henry Rutgers Chair of Human Microbiome at Rutgers, where he also serves as professor of medicine and pathology. Previously, he served as chairs, chair of the Department of Medicine at New York University. A physician and microbiologist, he has been studying the relationships we have with the bacteria that live in us and microbes that affect us. Over the last 20 years, he has studied the relationship of the human microbiome to health and diseases, such as asthma, obesity, diabetes, cancer, and neurodevelopmental disorders. He has served as the advisor to many students, postdoctoral fellows, and junior faculty. He is chair of the Presidential Advisory Council for Combating Antibiotic Resistance Bacteria. He holds 28 US patents and has written more than 600 original articles. A member of the National Academy of Medicine he has received the Alexander Fleming Award and the Robert Koch Gold Medal for his contributions to medical research. He wrote Missing Microbes, a book targeted to general audiences and translated into 20 languages. Dr. Maria Gloria Dominguez Bello joined Rutgers School of Environmental and Biological Sciences in 2018 and is the director of the New Jersey Institute for Food, Nutrition and Health and the Henry Rutgers Professor of Microbiome and Health. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology, of the Infectious Diseases Society of America, and of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. She has served on the editorial boards of several journals and has more than 150 scientific publications. Her research focuses on microbiome development from birth, functions for the host, impact by practices that reduce microbial transmission or disrupt the microbiota, and strategies for restoration. She also studies how westernization changes environmental microbes and human exposures, integrating the fields of anthropology and architecture, urban studies into microbial ecology. Before joining Rutgers, she worked at the Venezuelan Institute of Scientific Research, the University of Puerto Rico, and the New York University School of Medicine. Dr. Li Ping Zhao is the Evely Fenton Chair of Applied Microbiology a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology, a senior fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, and a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for the Center of Microbiome Research and Education of the American Gastroenterology Society, Association. He has published many papers in high-ranking journals, which has made him a world-renowned scientist in the human microbiome field. His pioneering research applies metagenomics, metabolomics integrated tools, and dietary interventions for manipulating gut microbiota to improve human metabolic health. His research has led to important discoveries such as identifying pathogens in obese individuals that confer increased obesity risk and modulating gut microbiota with diet that can significantly alleviate metabolic diseases, including a genetic form of obesity in children and type two diabetes in adults. Science Magazine features his work on combating traditional Chinese medicine and gut microbiota to help fight obesity. Dr. Devashish Bhattacharya is a distinguished professor of biochemistry and microbiology and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He studies the impact of environmental changes on the biology of aquatic species with a focus on algae and corals. His research includes using genomic tools to elucidate the pathways that are used by these species to deal with environmental stresses, such as temperature and pH changes in rapidly warming oceans, as well as the consequences of biotic interactions on their biology and adaptability. 
The Bhattacharya team is also one of the leading research groups who study the origin and evolution of red algae, including the organisms able to live in hot springs, and has worked on his research for more than 20 years. He has published more than 250 papers. Bhattacharya has received the Phycological Society of America Award of Excellence and the Botanical Society of America Dar Baker Prize. Thank you all for being here tonight to speak to us. Please note, all attendees have been placed on mute for the duration of this discussion. If you have questions, please send them via the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentations. Each speaker will have a few minutes for questions after their presentations with a longer Q&A to, to follow at the end. We will get to as many questions as possible within the time frame of this event. If we do not get to your question, we'll be happy to follow up with you after. This event is being recorded and will be distributed to all attendees. It is now my privilege to turn it over to Dr. Martin Blazer. Thank you very much, Brittany. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. And I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, uh, can you? Okay, good. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Blazer. I have the pleasure of introducing to you uh, the Rutgers University Microbiome Program, which we call RUMP. Uh, we're gonna give a series of short presentations Mine will be the longest because I'm gonna talk about RUMP and also about my own work. And the other faculty members will talk about their work uh, exclusively. So let's begin. So welcome to the microbiome. What is the microbiome? Uh, the microbiome is all the microbes that live in the human body. And we can think of five special characteristics. The first, is that the microbial cells in our body outnumber our human cells. Second, these microbes are highly diverse. You can think of it as that each of us has a big zoo living inside us. The composition of, of these zoos are similar across everyone. Every zoo has a cat house and a reptile house, yet every individual is unique, and that creates an interesting tension. And it's now become clear that human biology is based on this partnership between microbes and our cells. It's not just humans. In fact, every, in this picture, every animal has their own microbiome. The soil has its microbiome, water, air. So microbiome is, is a new frontier in biology. The microbiome has been in the news uh, extensively recently. Uh, from uh, probiotics to nutrition, to uh, mothers, to babies, to sustainable environment. The microbiome is, is a very hot area in science. And consequently, about two years ago, we began the Rutgers University Microbiome Program, which we call RUMP. It has five major functions here, research, education, clinical care, and environmental science, actually only four functions. There are a number of different pillars to our, our rump, including clinical studies, nutritional research, environmental studies, public health, and, and importantly, how to restore a missing microbiota. We are trying to position New Jersey as a demonstration state, and we're trying to take advantage of the resources of a great national university like Rutgers. Here are the pillars of our programs, and this will be in the, uh, in the uh, slides that you'll receive later. Uh, we wanna improve clinical care. We want to advance conservation and su sustainability. We would like to grow fundamental knowledge. We hope to be a global resource in education and training about the microbiome. And we wanna enhance the infrastructure across the university. This is a university-wide project. Uh, the RUMP has three leaders. Uh, three of them are in this presentation, myself, Maria Gloria Dominguez, and Li Ping Zhao. In addition, we have a very large organizing committee across the university, representing, for example, the School of Pharmacy, School of Arts and Sciences, School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, RWJ Medical School, New Jersey Medical School, Department of Pharmacology, Strategic Alliances and University Core Resources, 
and so forth. And I want to point out our administrator, Vinod Parmer, who organizes it and gets us all together. I also want to mention Brittany Barco and Melissa McKillop, who are helping us in terms of advancement and philanthropy. As uh, Brittany mentioned, uh, RUMP has been named as one of the 12 big ideas of Rutgers University. These are the 12 big ideas to better the world. And there we are, the Rutgers University Microbiome Program, harnessing microbiomes to improve human health. We have a number of institutional partners across Rutgers University, different uh, uh, organizations. And we have many corporate, state, and federal partners already. You can see a partial list here. Uh, this year, we had a retreat. It was a virtual retreat because of COVID, but we had more than 300 participants and uh, more than 100 presentations at our retreat, again, across the whole university. Now, the first medical and scientific commission for RUMP has been to improve the health of children in New Jersey. We might consider why is asthma so common in kids in New Jersey and everywhere? Why does New Jersey have such high rates of young children developing autism? Why is obesity becoming an increasing problem and occurring at younger ages? Our approach has been to begin the New Jersey Kids Study. The vision of this study is to enroll pregnant women to de develop a diverse observational birth cohort across New Jersey. We hope to follow 5,000 children until the age of 10 and to create a platform for interdisciplinary studies on complex determinants of child health, including development, disease, and microbiome. Here's a little about our structure. We're, we're developing internal advisory boards, community board. Our content involves obstetrics, general pediatrics, neurodevelopment, immune development, metabolic development. And we have methods teams for biospecimens, microbiome, genetics, data integration and regulation. And already we have a number of partners to New Jersey Kids Study. Uh, here's our leadership. Uh, Gloria and I are both involved and colleagues in other parts of the university. Our approach will be to recruit pregnant women in key obstetric clinics in North, Central and South New Jersey. We want to follow mothers and their children longitudinally from pregnancy through childhood, obtaining surveys, clinical data, and biospecimens from them and from the fathers. And we want to use this as a platform for ancillary studies. Our initial steps include that we have received startup funding from the state of New Jersey. We have formed a partnership with investigators from CHILD, the Canadian Healthy Infant Longitudinal Development Cohort Study. They have been doing this for 15 years and have a vast amount of knowledge. Our study it will be different in many ways, but we will learn from CHILD, who have become our partners. During this first year, we hope to establish the team and protocols, infrastructure, approvals, and pilot procedures, and we hope to secure additional funding resources. That's all I'm gonna say about RUMP today. And now I'm just gonna to turn to the research that I've been doing. And I'm just gonna call this antibiotics at the crossroads. What do I mean by this? Well, all of us know of antibiotics as one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. It's been in, they've been in medicine since the late 1940s. They've saved innumerable lives <clears throat> and they've revolutionized every aspect of medicine. But as a result, medical practitioners are using antibiotics more and more and more. How much more? Well, about 73 billion antibiotic doses annually each year. That's 10 antibiotic pills for every man, woman, and child on earth. In the US, the CDC counted 258 million courses in 2010. That's 833 courses per thousand population. Five courses for every six people year after year. In children, by the time they're two, based on the CDC data, 2.7 courses. By the time they're 10, 10 courses of antibiotics. And pregnant women, more than 50% are being treated with antibiotics or given antibiotics as prophylaxis. And there's also antibiotic exposure from use on the farm. Now we have 
all been concerned about the ecological effects of antibiotic exposures, which I draw as the proverbial iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is antibiotic resistance, that our antibiotics are failing because of resistance emerging. And this is a, a major problem, but in fact, I believe it's just the tip of the iceberg. The body of the iceberg is what antibiotics are doing to the microbiome. They're disrupting it and causing clinical consequences. These consequences may be transient or long-term. They could be developmental, situational, senescent, or generational. And they could involve such things as immunologic processes, metabolic, neoplastic like cancer, and maternal processes. I'll show you some examples. Now, I'd like to show you very briefly the key results in five studies that we've, we've done recently. The first study is a study we did with colleagues at the Mayo Clinic, where we studied all the children born in Olmsted County, Minnesota, where the Mayo Clinic is located, over a 13-year period. In total, we analyzed 14,000 children. And the question we asked is, were they exposed to antibiotics in the first two years of life or not? There were 10,000 exposed, 4,000 not exposed. And now we wanted to know, what were their health outcomes? What would, what's gonna happen between the age of two and 13 in these children? Here's the result for asthma. This is a plot of the time to developing asthma in children according to their sex and by antibiotic exposure. The red lines are girls, the blue lines are boys. This, this, and here's age, and here's the probability of asthma. So this solid red line are girls who did not receive antibiotics before two, and here's girls who did receive antibiotics. The rate is higher. Here's boys, no antibiotics, boys with antibiotics, also higher rate. So the rate is about double. In fact, we looked at 10 common health conditions with childhood onset. Here's the list. You'll recognize many of them. Asthma, hay fever, food allergies, eczema, celiac disease, overweight, obesity, ADHD, autism, learning disability. <clears throat> Here's a plot looking at the risk of developing these diseases by whether they had received antibiotics before two or not. For of, of these 10 disorders, all of them are on this side of the line of one, which is neutrality. That means antibiotics were associated with the development of these diseases. And the, the circles in red, these are ones that are all statistically significant. So eight out of the 10, there are significant associations of early life antibiotics and the development of the disease. And we also found specific associations with number of antibiotic courses, timing of exposure, and antibiotic class. So this is correlational data. Is it really causal? Well, one thing that we've known for the last 70 years is that farmers feed antibiotics to their livestock to fatten them up. It's called growth promotion. So we began to do studies in mice. This was done by Dr. Il-Sung Cho when he was a fellow in my lab. Here's study two, we're studying metabolism, looking at body fat in antibiotic exposed and controlled mice. So Il-Sung gave mice four different regimens of antibiotics used on the farm or no antibiotics. And then he measured how much fat. And we could see that the mice that received the antibiotics put on more fat. You can see it here in comparison to this. This was our first evidence that antibiotics were changing metabolism. In the second study, uh, in our third study, uh, we looked at immunity. Here we're looking at the effect of antibiotic treatments on the development of type one diabetes in a particular kind of mouse that is susceptible to diabetes. Shusang Zhang gave mice three courses of antibiotics or no antibiotics, and then tracked whether the mice would develop diabetes. Or he just gave them one course of, diabetes, of antibiotics or not and tracked the diabetes. Here's the incidence of, of, of type one diabetes in the mice. The blue lines are the control mice, no antibiotics. The red lines are the mice that received antibiotics, either one or three courses. The antibiotics gave them diabetes earlier and more. So antibiotics, were accelerating and enhancing this disease. Fourth study just published last month, a study of, of the brain, the effects of early life penicillin exposure on the gut microbiome and the frontal cortex and amygdala of the brain gene expression. 
and mice received penicillin or not. We looked at the brain, we looked at the intestine, we found many differences. It was clear that antibiotics were affecting gene expression in the brain. So what are we gonna do about this? Well, there are two solutions. One is we need to curtail the unnecessary use of antibiotics, but the other is that we have to start thinking of how are we gonna restore microbes to antibiotic exposed individuals, especially children. So in the fifth study, we go back to that type 1 diabetes model that Xu Song Zhang developed. And in addition to a group of mice that received antibiotics or not, we had a third group that received antibiotics, and then we gave them back mom poop to see if we could restore their microbiome. So here's what happened to their diabetes. Here's the control group in blue. Here's the antibiotic group in red. They have more diabetes, just as we saw in the earlier study. And, and in the group that got antibiotics and then got mom poop, we pretty much restored them back to the baseline. So this indicates that restoration does work. And it's also a pathway for discovery of microbes, of microbial genes, of metabolites, of host genes, all perturbed by antibiotics that drive autoimmunity and that can be restored. So let me just summarize. Uh, I've talked about a lot so far. Uh, humans in our microbiome, we are developing approaches to understanding the functions of the microbiome. We have model systems to identify the agents causing disease and to eliminate them. We aim to translate the knowledge gained from experimental animals and from large observational studies in humans like the New Jersey Kids Study to improve children's health. And that ends my presentation. Now we have time for a couple of questions, uh, if there are any questions, and I'm just gonna uh, stop sharing my screen. And it looks like there are some questions. So, and I'm just gonna mention, uh, uh, I'm going to um, answer two questions. The first is what are the main sources of human microbiome destruction? And what are the long range effects of that destruction on human health? Well, I've pointed out that antibiotic is a very important source of destruction. And, uh, uh, and doc, uh, Dr. Maria Gloria Dominguez will talk about cesarean section with, uh, uh, not, with children not getting antibiotics. We think probably that one of the uh, clouds of, of, of the silver lining of having clean water is that chlorination has an effect on the microbiome as well. What are the effects? Well, as I showed you, uh, there's more and more evidence that uh, antibiotic perturbed microbiome has an effect on childhood onset diseases. Second question, wouldn't someone who got antibiotics for a reason have the predisposition of getting issues even if they, if they didn't really get antibiotics? And that's a very good question also. And the answer is that's why we do studies in mice to take away the issue of that the antibiotics are given for a reason. In the mice, everything is the same except one group gets antibiotics and the other doesn't. So we can isolate the effect of the antibiotics. We're gonna, we'll have other questions and I'm gonna save those for the general question and answer period. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Gloria Dominguez who will give the next talk. Uh, Gloria. Thank you, Marty. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about microbiomes in the Anthropocene, in the modern times. So my, my group, my lab has done research uh, comparing lifestyles and what is the microbiome like uh, across different cultures and peoples. And this graph shows the diversity of the intestinal microbiome as people uh, change their lifestyle with, from uh, jungle, a very basic uh, ancestral lifestyle to rural to the US industrial. And what you can see is that the gut microbiota diversity decreases with urbanization. The reasons for this, um, so in parallel, there is also a decrease in infectious diseases incidence, uh, but it's a disease trade what we are witnessing. We are, we are not winning the battle entirely because what we are seeing now is an increase in immune and metabolic diseases and probably brain and behavioral diseases as well. The reason for this uh, decrease in infectious diseases is clear. 
sanitation and medicine certainly are highly antimicrobial. And this is a sword of double edge because on one side, antimicrobials control pathogens, but they are also harming our good microbes. And this is related to their modern diseases, which have uh, early origins in life and which are modulated by microbes. Early origins as early as the fetus in the womb of the mother. The fetus is exposed to the products of the uh, microbiome of the mother. It's only at, at birth and then postnatally when the baby sees for the first time and acquires human microbes. So at birth, the birth canal is full of good microbes that then the milk will boost. Uh, the baby will be exposed a lot to the skin and the mouth of the mother. So a lot of maternal microbes being transferred to that baby. And later on, uh, when the baby is mature enough, the baby is exposed to uh, environmental microbes. Mom matters because those human co-evolved microbes uh, that have been passed through generations through our evolution and currently through through their generations of humans are passed through a maternal, a matrilineal uh, line of first uh, primordial exposure to vaginal microbes of mothers. When babies are born by C-section, they bypass this exposure. And we have shown, and this is, a, we call this a PC, P, principal coordinate analysis, where each sphere is a bacterial community. You can see the mouth of the mothers in green, the vaginal communities in red, and the skin of the mothers in blue. And then all body sites of newborns, if they were born vaginally, their microbes anywhere in their body resemble vaginal microbes. If they were born by C-section, they resemble skin. So C-section babies start their, their life with the skin microbiota from the air of the operating room. And we can see here in another uh, publication, a nice graph of how uh, across the first months of life, the relative abundance of all, all these different bacteria that are depicted in different colors. If the baby is born vaginally, it's pretty stable during the first month. C-section babies have a very dynamic catch up uh, of bacteria, but they really never catch up. This, is a, this depicts a 24 months of life of the blue trajectory of the microbiome of babies born vaginally, or the red trajectory of the intestinal microbiome of uh, babies born by C-section. They don't catch up really. They, they are different to the normal. C-section is associated with diseases. Which diseases? The same diseases, antibiotics increase the risk. Obesity, these are growth curves of normal babies in green or C-section born babies that grow faster and bigger. Type one diabetes is increased in C-section born and autism spectrum disorder, ADS. This is a list of publications and the ones with the red stars are the ones that find significant increase in the risk for ASD which affects one in 54 adults in the US. Sure. So what we reason is uh, if vaginal birth gives microbes to the baby and those babies develop normally in the blue trajectory and C-section perturbs that trajectory, can we give microbes back and restore? And that's what we did with a, after babies born by C-section, as soon as they were born, we provided vaginal microbes of their own mothers and then measured the trajectory. And what we found is that uh, we can normalize at least partially. You can see the blue trajectory of the vaginally born babies, the normal babies, feces, mouth, or skin. The red lines are pretty distant from the blue in feces, mouth, and skin. And the green lines are babies that were also born by C-section like, like the red, but they were given microbes of the mother at birth. And you can see that the line moves halfway 
in the feces and moves pretty much to the normal region, normal trajectory in the mouth and in the skin. So microbial restoration is possible. What we still don't know is, so what? Those babies are developing with a normal microbiota. Are they pr protected against the increased risks of diseases? We don't know this yet because we need a randomized clinical trial, very big, five years following up to uh, uh, measure outcomes such as diabetes or allergy or asthma, obesity. So we also participated uh, with a big uh, Rio birth, uh, birth cohort in Brazil, where Armando Bayer and Natalia Nascolini um, were interested in the microbiome aspect. They follow baby, uh, mothers, pregnant mothers, and then their babies for six months. Their main focus is exposure to pollutants, which is another pro problem of modern societies in the Anthropocene. But I just want to show you the results on their tests on development. They measure the Denver de developmental uh, screening tests that measures different parameters of development. And in their personal social domain, of 36 kids, five fail the test. And this is the diversity of their fecal microbiota in the meconium when they were uh, newborns. Those five babies have an abnormally low microbiota diversity in relation to normal. In the space, uh, the, the two segregate significantly, um, the two structure of the communities, and we know which taxa the babies that fail the text uh, have, uh, um, the, have lower than normal. The same for the um, personal, uh, the same for the language domain, they, the two babies who fail the test have abnormally low microbiota diversity in their meconium, and we know which bacteria were low. So our reasoning is if with industrialization, we are degrading the diversity of the human microbiota, and this is related to the increase in modern diseases, can we stop or even better revert this trend by giving back microbes at the right time. This will need to restore, to know when and how and what to restore. And it, it will need to bank microbes because the microbial diversity is disappearing. So together with uh, many people at Rutgers and Rutgers as an institution uh, being an important stakeholder, we are leading the global microbiota vault to conserve the future health of humanity. This is a global project uh, across all countries where we want to foster uh, regional and local collections of microbes so that they can be characterized and then studied to restore. But most importantly, we want to provide a safe vault where those microbes can be preserved uh, to posterity and, and use the local collections to work, uh, to do the research. It involves the local collections, it involves education because it happens that the high diversity hotspots in macro diversity are also the high diversity hotspots in micro diversity. And this is the developing world that has not industrialized yet. So we need, uh, we are uh, organizing uh, um, workshops for education, technology transfer, and research cooperation, in addition to providing uh, a safe vault, uh, fostering research across different teams to improve health. So what we want and what we need as a technological society is to develop technologies respecting our biology. We are not random. We are, whether we like it or not, we are product of our own biological evolution. And we need to understand our biology and respect it so that we can optimize health. And this applies to both human microbes as well as environmental. Thank you very much. And I would be uh, happy to answer a couple of questions if we have time.
Yeah, we have time. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. There, there are more than a couple, but uh, one of the questions is: Do C-section babies show a higher rate of sickness before they reach infancy? Before they, they I guess reach... while the mom is pregnant. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure I understand the question. So C-section by itself has some risks for the mother and for the baby. I, I, it, you know, the risk is not zero. If you look at the NICU, the units in in the pediatric um, intensive care, there are more babies born by C-section. But of course, C-section is performed because it's needed. So uh, again, C-section is a procedure, an intervention that saves lives. Uh, what we need to understand is, can we do the intervention and then provide restoration so that we normalize that baby in this case the best we can so that development can proceed the most natural, uh, in the most natural way possible. Here's a second question. World Health Organization reports bottle, bottle feeding correlation to obesity. Is breast versus bottle feeding correlated to C-section births? Very good question also. So breastfeeding protects against obesity and that was shown uh, 20 years ago in a very elegant study. And, and since then it has been very well established. Uh, that's something we are very interested in studying. What is it in the breast milk that uh, controls and protects against obesity? It, there is a tendency that because C-section is a sudden interruption of pregnancy and the mother of the mother realizes suddenly that the baby's out, it takes 24 hours at least for the mother to produce milk, to produce the hormones that produce milk. So since there is no labor, there is no preparation of the body and there is indeed a higher failure of breastfeeding among mothers that give birth by C-section. Uh, Gloria, thank you. We'll, have, we'll return to you for questions later. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Li Ping Zhao, uh, who's our uh, third speaker. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Li Ping Zhao. I would like to talk about why nutrition can be the best medicine if you pay attention to the nutritional needs of your gut microbiome. Before I talk, I need to declare a conflict of interest. I'm co-founder of a Rutgers microbiome startup, Notisha Biotechnologies Company. I like the analogy that views our gut microbiome as a microbial Amazon jungle. In the Amazon jungle, organisms work together as functional groups called guilds. Members in the same guild can be very different species, but they survive and uh, thrive together. We found that gut bacteria also organize themselves as guilds. Bacteria in the same guild may be very different in taxonomy, but they tend to stick together to make a better living. The natural graph shows that different guilds can cooperate or compete with each other. Some guilds are beneficial to human, others pathogenic and detrimental. They can drive inflammation produce all kinds of toxins to aggravate various diseases. So we know that tall trees are the foundation species to a rainforest. If you lose the tall trees, you lose the whole ecosystem eventually. We found that a special group of beneficial bacteria plays a foundational role in structuring a healthy gut microbiome and keeping it stable. We call this group of bacteria the foundation gill. If your foundation guild is present and above a certain threshold, bad bacteria would be suppressed and you will, you will stay healthy. The relationship between foundation guild and the pathogens is just like a seesaw. If your foundation guild is damaged or lost, the pathogen guild would overgrow and aggravate various diseases. This means that the best probiotics for you is your own foundation guild bacteria. The good news is that most people still have these bacteria inside their gut. The bad news is that even for healthy people, these bacteria are at a very low level because our modern day diet contains little nutrients to support them. 
if they are so important, where can you get your foundation given bacteria from first place? Humans have evolved mechanisms to establish the foundation given bacteria early in our lives. Babies receive the foundation given bacteria mostly from their mothers at birth. They also receive some foundation given bacteria from interactions with other family members. Every family has their own foundation given family tree, as shown by Dr. Blazer and uh, Dominica. C section, antibiotic use, or formula feeding could disrupt the gut microbiome. Such modern day practices may interfere with the transfer of foundation guild bacteria among family members and may eventually drive the foundation guild in the family to extinction. How can you grow your foundation guild to a high enough level? Just having the seeds of the tall trees is not enough to build a forest. You need to provide the nutrition to grow the tall trees above a certain abundance level so that you can have your forest. We found that nutrients which are non-digestible to human can serve as a nutrition to support the foundation guild in our gut. We call it microbiome nutrition. Over the last 15 years, we developed and tested a microbiome targeted dietary scheme called WTP diet, as it includes whole grains, traditional Chinese medicinal food, and prebiotics. We have done and published a series of clinical trials by using this diet to modulate gut microbiota and improve various diseases, including obesity and type 2 diabetes. I was the first volunteer to use this diet. I lost 45 pounds and recovered from metabolic syndrome. We helped this 26-year-old young man lost 130 pounds over 23 weeks and achieved a complete remission from type 2 diabetes. We also identified the first known pathogenic bacteria that can cause obesity and type 2 diabetes from his gut. WTP diet helped Prader-Willi syndrome children with genetic obesity lost 20 to 50% of their body weight and recovered from metabolic syndrome. WTP diet also helped type 2 diabetes patients significantly reduce HbA1c level. So in clinical and preclinical studies show that WTP diet can promote foundation guilt and elevate various diseases. Based on the genomic sequences of foundation guilt bacteria and through many tests, we have identified the nutrients in human diet that can specifically promote the foundation guilt. Together with Notisha, we developed a microbiome nutrition formula for patients. Currently, this microbiome formula has been given investigational new drug status by FDA and Notisha works with three labs at Rutgers to conduct four clinical trials to test the product's efficacy for patients with early COVID-19, Prader-Willi syndrome, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease. For the generally healthy populations, my lab at Rutgers would like to launch the Family Microbiome Project. We would like to recruit 1,000 families and work with their members to find out if they still have the Foundation Guild and help them to restore and promote their foundation guild to the best possible level. As shown in this example at the baseline, all the five members of a family had a similar gut microbiome regardless of their health status. After using our microbiome nutrition, the clinically healthy father and the daughter one showed a full restoration of their foundation guild. Mother and the daughter three who had a mild and moderate diseases showed a partial restoration of their foundation guild. Daughter three with severe disease so the no restoration of the foundation guild. These are the products Notisha will provide for FamBio. Guild Plus is a microbiome nutrition formula for supporting the foundation guild bacteria. Guild Quest is a stool collection kit. This makes it possible for people to collect a small stool sample in the comfort of their home and send it to us for analysis. In summary, we have developed the new technologies that can identify the foundation guild in each individual's gut microbiome. We have developed a microbiome nutrition product to promote the foundation guild. If some patients have permanent lost their foundation guild, we will be able to reseed and restore it for them with a new generation of probiotics called the live biotherapeutic product, and then use microbiome nutrition to keep it at a high enough population level. If you are interested, please sign up for joining our family microbiome project. We would highly appreciate if you could support us in whatever way you can. Thank you so much. Happy to take your questions. Uh, Li Ping, thank you very much. Uh, we already have one question for you, uh, which is, 
What is the effect of eating fermented foods on the gut microbiome, especially in the promotion or prevention of stomach and esophageal cancer? Okay. So uh, it depends on what two things. One is the bacteria in the fermented food, whether they actually have any beneficial effects. For example, whether that can be used to restore a healthier gut microbiome, suppressing pathogens in the patient's gut. And uh, we know that uh, uh, there are many publications to show that in uh, at least the colon cancer patient's gut, some uh, 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 carcinogen producing bacteria are overgrowing. So if the bacteria in the fermented food, they are the right ones can take over the gut ecosystem and uh, outcompete the carcinogen producing bacteria in the patient's gut, this may help. And also other nutrients, like we talk about the microbiome nutrition, if any nutrients in a fermented food, which can escape human digestion and absorption, and then become nutrients available to specifically support the growth of beneficial bacteria in the gut, and then this kind of fermented food would be helpful. But we need analysis and data to find out which specific uh, fermented food could be helpful to your patient. We have time for one more question right now. Can the lower GI tract successfully be populated by organisms taken orally, given the hostile, acidic environment of the stomach? Yeah, this is a question very often asked. So first, some of the normal members of the gut microbiota, they probably have evolved and co-evolved co with us over millions, millions of years. So they may have developed a mechanism to survive the acidic stomach and the upper intestine and then land and colonize the lower intestine. And another is the current, uh, you know, modern day technology is well developed, has been well developed to develop some formulations which can protect the live bacteria so that help them to escape the hostile environment in the upper intestine and then released and colonize the lower gut. So this uh, uh, would not be uh, too much of a concern. If you really identified some Im important bacteria, you want them to uh, come and colonize the lower gut, and you can do that, yeah. Uh, Li Ping, thank you very much. We're now gonna turn to the final talk uh, by Dr. Debashish Bhattacharya, uh, who will talk to us about microbiome and corals. Devashish. Thank you, Marty. After three really excellent talks about the human microbiome, uh, I'm going to turn this towards somewhat warmer climes. We're going to talk about corals and how modern microbiome and omics research can help us understand coral health and promote coral reef conservation. So just some beginner facts to start with. About 71% of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans, and there's at least 700,000 species, up to several million. Coral reefs cover less than 1% of the ocean surface, but house about a quarter of marine biodiversity. About half a billion people worldwide depend on coral reefs for food, livelihood, and coastal protection. Therefore, conserving corals and other threatened marine species, such as fish, shellfish, and their habitats is a really important focus of modern science. So what is a coral? If you're unfamiliar with it, a coral is a symbiosis between the host animal, a cnidarian, and a microbiome that's comprised of photosynthetic algae. In this image here, these little red dots, these are the dinoflagellate algae. They actually provide the coral its color when it's healthy and provide most of its energetic resources. There's also microbes and viruses that live there. So individual polyps form colonies that form reefs, such as the massive ones in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So the, 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 the big problem we have right now is, as you probably read in the news many times, is caused by global warming, uh, climate change, and it's turning these beautiful corals into this sort of ghostly white colors because the heating of the waters is, are causing the algae to, to uh, create chemicals that are toxic to the animal and they're kicking out the algae. So this is called um, uh, uh, global, it's called coral bleaching. And if it goes on long enough, the corals are more prone to disease and potential death. So when we look at the coral 
as a meta organism that is just like a human we have we have the host we have lots of uh members of the microbiome, there's actually a lot of variation, just like in humans in the coral. So the algal microbiome can vary. These different color bars represent different species of algae that live in different coral colonies. So that plays a very important role. As, and just like in humans, the bacterial microbiome can vary, showing here different bacterial phyla with different colors under controlled and bleached conditions. So there's a lot of research going on now on the role of the bacterial microbiome and whether probiotics can be used in corals, just like in humans to promote resilience. So I'll talk about some research in our lab and this, in a simple way, we embrace the complexity of the holobiont. That is, we can look at each part of the coral separately or we can look at the entire colony at once. And this is the work I'll talk about right now. So this is a picture I took this summer when I was snorkeling um, off the coast on the North shore of Hawaii. This is a healthy coral reef where we do a lot of our research at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, showing three of the major uh, types of coral we work on, the rice coral, Montipra, the cauliflower coral, Pasilopra, and the finger coral, Parides. So our lab is a genomics and bioinformatics lab. So we do what is called multi-omics. And that omics word is an attached to approaches like genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. And we use all of these tools together to understand the basis of coral health and also how corals respond to thermal and other stresses that can lead to their uh, poor health. Well, Rutgers is a great place to do this research. It has very strong roots in, in marine biology, but corals don't obviously occur in the coastal waters of New Jersey. Therefore, we go to places like Hawaii, do our field work, grow the corals in tanks, for example, here, some of us working in Hawaii this summer. Once that's done, the corals come back, are shipped to uh, Rutgers Frozen or live. Then we have a wonderful group of people to work with. This includes Xiao Yang Su and Eric Childs, who work at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey, and they're metabolomics experts who become wonderful coral experts. And they do a lot of work with us on coral metabolomics. We have a group of people in my lab, postdocs and graduate students and undergrads uh, who are learning or are really well trained in bioinformatic methods. They, so they look at the complicated data sets and integrate multiomics. Then we work with Mehdi Javanmard and his student, Zhulun Meng, who are experts in building devices that can take on different coral tissues and tell you how much stress the coral is feeling, just like they would do for human disease. Finally, we finished this virtual circle with working with Phil Clevis. He's at the Carnegie Institute, and he was the first one to apply CRISPR-Cas9 reverse genetics to corals. So we worked with Phil to validate ideas about what coral genes are doing, hopefully to make great science and also lead to applications. So let me give you an example of how an experiment might work. So we take um, ambient and heat stress conditions. We grow corals in tanks in Hawaii, and we gather omics data. Then we look for thermal stress markers. So just like for human health, if you have a disease and a healthy population, you want to be able to diagnose when a healthy person might be uh, on the road to getting a disease. So we want to do the same thing for thermal stress for corals. And our recent work with Xiao Yang and our, and our colleagues turned up a really cool set of markers of thermal stress in corals that accumulate prior to bleaching. So they're diagnostic of growing stress and there's something called dipeptides. These are two amino acids that are bound together. Here is one, arginine and glutamine, RQ for short. That shows a really, really interesting pattern in terms of diagnosing coral stress. Here under control conditions in these uh, turquoise um, dots, you see that their amounts don't change over time. Whereas as you apply thermal stress over time, this metabolite increases in accumulation, showing a pattern that's typical from early stress in T1 to late stress at T5, suggesting it's diagnostic of thermal stress in the coral. This, this, this uh, result is not too shocking. It turns out that for several years, people who have studied arginal glutamine uh, in mice have shown that it counteracts hyperoxia. So thermal stress causes the algae in corals to create too much oxygen. They become too active before synthetic. That oxygen becomes toxic. So we think that the dipeptide may be playing a similar role in corals by, det by detoxifying the excess of oxygen and its products. We can also look at um, metabolomic and other data, just like we look at social networks. 
We can arrange the metabolites based on their accumulation, positive or negative relative to each other. We can identify who's the central, who's a very important metabolite in a particular stress response. Here, for example, this woman in the middle, she would be the hub. And when we do that with coral metabolites, something really cool comes out. So work in our lab that was led by Amanda Williams, a graduate student showed that there are coral specific metabolites called montiporic acids. Here's two forms, A and D that sit in a, in a metabolite network that connects a bunch of algal stress metabolites to a bunch of animal stress metabolites. So we know the animal is producing this, but it's actually then creating a signal that allows it to interact with the alga and then to create an environment that tries to uh, lower the stress that's created by, by uh, increasing temperatures. These are some of the structures of monoporic acids. We can also study a really foundational important aspect of coral reproduction that's mass bonding. Two, three times a year during a new moon or high moon or a new moon or full moon, uh, corals will, uh, colonies will release egg and sperm at the same time. The synchronous sort of release of egg and sperm bundles allows the next generation to happen and the mixing of different genotypes. So can we use um, metabolomics to predict the onset and strength of spawning? We know that climate change is diminishing mass spawning, so can we get some insight into that? It turns out we can. Here, for example, in the 2019 mass spawning for the rice coral, there are three well-known sex hormones that show a pattern of accumulation again to the T1, T3, T5, where the mass spawning happened at this point. So we can actually measure this metabolite in healthy and diseased corals and get an idea about the onset and the strength of the spawning that's coming, which is critical to coral reproduction and their futures. We can also do something much simpler, which is what we're, what I'll talk about a little bit here. So if you don't have all these fancy machines, is there a simple way for us to assess coral health that can be used by non-scientists? Well, we started using something that's quite cool. These are test strips designed to monitor human health. Turns out that animals, corals, humans, and other animals share a lot of similar pathways in response to stress. So working um, with our uh, with our collaborators in Hawaii and and. Uh, also with Mehdi Javanmard, we would collect corals that are healthy, bleached, or of unknown health. We would freeze that tissue, grind it in buffer, and we would dip test strips that are made for human health into that. For example, these are the AccuTest urine analysis strips, and to see what reaction we get that differentiates healthy versus uh, stressed corals. And uh, Jolun has designed a 3D printed a holder for a, for a, for a a, a, a phone that has a smart app that can do a red, blue, green color analysis. So this can be done literally in the field. And this is what we're developing right now for doing a rapid assay for coral health. Does it work? Here's an example. The ketone test is used by a lot of people and measures energy deprivation. This deprivation leads to fat burning producing ketones and in humans can be uh, indicative of diabetic keto acidosis. Well, in corals, in the stress sensitive coral pocillopra, under continuing stress, we see the accumulation of ketones using this color test, suggesting that there's a clear signal of energy deprivation, that this coral is suffering and is trying to burn its reserves to keep it, itself alive. In contrast, the stress-resistant Montipara rice coral, which we know can withstand a lot more thermal stress, we see an initial strong reaction, but over time, that goes down. This suggests that this coral has a strong initial reaction, but it's followed by acclimation to thermal stress. And therefore this is likely to be a more stress resistant uh, species of coral. So we've done this with other sort of uh, um, uh, uh, strip test assays for the immune response aspects of blood, not real blood in coral, but sort of aspects of, of so iron usage in corals, glucose and so on, and they all show promise. So let me end my talk by, by telling you what's uh, uh, in the future. This is a view on the backside of HIMB. This island's called Mokolue. And uh, what we plan to do is we want to use emerging methods like reverse genetics, single cell analysis to study corals, their biology, their stress responses. This project was just funded by the National Science Foundation. We want to expand the strip test to other places in Hawaii. Micronesia, Palau, Florida, to see how general they are and to gather data on the population level. We want to build a handheld device that uses protein data to monitor coral stress. This is work in collaboration with Mehdi Javanmard, who's an expert in this area. 
want to train reef managers and citizen scientists in the usage of these tools. So this summer we plan to go to Micronesia and to work with the indigenous people there to, to learn from them, but also to train them in the use of the strip tests and these uh, metabolomic methods so they can um, assess the health of their own local coral reefs. And I guess most importantly, we want to train rump students in environmental microbiome and holobiont analysis using these systems approaches where we take multiple sophisticated methods and then we uh, apply them to an important ecological problem and then we integrate those data to figure out what can be done to understand or conserve those species. So my final slide, uh, here are some links to our lab website. We've created a number of uh, YouTube uh, videos that are on YouTube that can uh, that that show what we do in our lab, coral research, and other types of algal research. Please feel free to check those out. I also want to acknowledge the sources of support that uh, uh, that help us do our research. And um, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank thank you very much, Devashish. Uh, the first question is. Knowing the metabolite differences in the coral environment, could characterizing fungal and bacterial biomes help understand responses to stress in the coral environment? Do you believe that probiotic efforts to restore coral health would, would aid given the environment? Yes, so the latter, there is evidence that there are, that, that if you just like, um, um, it was spoken by, by Li Ping, if you take the, 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 the microbiome from a healthy coral and you use that to, um, uh, to, to replace the microbiome in stress corals, there's actually a positive beneficial effect of that. So one of the really important aspects of when we do this embrace the complexity approach is we, we're generating metabolites from the entire coral colony or a piece of the colony. We don't we use a very small amount. So we don't know exactly where the metabolite comes from. So now we're applying tools uh, metagenomic and metatranscriptomic tools where we have to create genomes of all of the different species that live together, take all the expressed genes, map them back under different conditions, and start to build a model of how the different members of this uh, holobiont are, are contributing and what they're contributing to different stress responses. So that's a really major challenge, but that's something that is the sort of the next steps in our research, and we're pursuing those right now. And we suspect that fungi that are also known to exist in corals, as well as uh, other unknown eukaryotes might also be important, uh, play important roles in the stress response. Uh, Devashish, you could stop sharing your screen. And uh, uh, another question is, how important a role does the viral bacteriophage biome play in the health of coral or other marine ecosystems? Has this been very intensively studied? Yeah, so viruses are the most abundant um, entities in our planet. Uh, and so, so it's been studied intensely for their role in, uh, for example, algal blue. There, there, there are many algae that are, that are actually, um, large populations are brought down by viruses that are specific. Cyanobacteria have cyanophage that also are very specific. So we, we are starting to look at in the metagenome data that's been created, we're going to look for viruses. And one of the really big problems with virals, viral research is um, we don't know what exactly they are. So virus genomes are highly diverged and their gene complement can vary crazily. So if you have a known database of known viruses, you can hope to find examples of those viruses in the microbiome. But if you do not have that information, then you have to try to figure out whether you can isolate some of the viruses and try to understand how they're, what, they're in, what their roles are. So the viruses are inherently very, very important to the holobiont, but that's an area of research that is probably the least well-developed because there's just so much genomic diversity in viruses that is unknown. It's really hard to know when you have a particular virus and how to interpret the information because many of the genes may have unknown functions. Uh, Debashis, thank you. Uh, Li Ping and Gloria, can you uh, appear on video, please? Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, will go to Li Ping. Uh, the question is, is it better to obtain probiotics from non-dairy sources versus dairy sources? Yeah, people have uh, many questions about the probiotics. Actually, dairy sources or non-dairy sources, they are just the vehicle or the carrier for the beneficial bacteria you would like to take. It doesn't matter. I think what matters is what kind of beneficial mm -hmm. bacteria 
and you really use to prepare the probiotic product. And you must have solid science to support that those bacteria, the manufacturer select and put into either dairy products or non-dairy products, they are really you know, beneficial to human, safe. And when they come to our gut, they can survive the upper intestine and they can colonize the lower gut or they can at least transiently grow there and do something uh, beneficial to the human host. You, know, you need a solid science to make sure that whatever the product is, the bacteria are there, are safe and beneficial. Thank you, Li Ping. The next question is to Gloria. What in urbanization is driving the decreased microbiome? Is it environmental, such as pollution, plastic, BPA exposure, for example? How can, does public health and social determinants of health play a role? Right, so the, the first candidates are obviously the antimicrobials. So antimicrobials are like atomic bombs. They kill the bad guys, but they also kill the good guys. Um, we know, and, and that's a part of the uh, Rio cohort uh, study, pollutants also alter the microbiome and they alter the microbiome of very young babies. They, they alter the microbiome um, after ut in utero exposure of the babies that are born. So we know pollu pollutants uh, and probably everything. So we are making a complete, complete mess of this planet. And that's going to, is coming back as a boomerang against us. Because, you know, if we produce, a, even if we produce very good quality of food in terms of balance of uh, nutrients, but we are killing the environment using pollutants that we are breathing or uh, absorbing in the skin, that's harming us. So we, again, we need to learn how to respect nature because we need nature working well for our own health. Um, that's something we are finding that more and more, many, many things affect the microbiome, including stress. There is a question about the effect of COVID uh, on the microbiome. Uh, stress also can harm the microbiome. And again, kids are the most vulnerable. So the next question is one I'll take. It says, for the Mayo Clinic study in children less than two years old, what were the differences in baseline demographics and what could have been some confounders such as breastfeeding, initial health status, et cetera? Um, so that, uh, that was an epidemiologic study. It's, it's observational. Uh, it's, it's very hard to test hypotheses uh, uh, the, the way we can do in an experiment. But in that study, we, contro we controlled for such factors as breastfeeding, family size, maternal age, maternal smoking as well. But that's why we combine epidemiologic studies with experimental studies in mice. In mice, we can directly test hypotheses. And together, we can put together a body of knowledge that will tell us which kinds of events are causal. Now, I'm, I'm going to go back up, and, and we're going to go back to uh, uh, Gloria again, um, um, uh, and the question is, if, if the mom takes antibiotics before pregnancy, would the baby have effects? Yes. So we know that um, pregnancy antibiotics already can affect uh, the maternal microbiota and therefore the baby microbiota as well. Uh, and mothers in the United States moms take uh, almost three courses on average, two to three courses of antibiotics during pregnancy. And again, there is not, the, people still don't recognize the risks involved. Uh, one other question for Gloria right now. Uh, where are the vaults stirred? Can you describe Rutgers' role and how are the microbes preserved over time? So the, the effort of the vault is a complex one. It's not, it's not only the final repository for which we have Switzerland and Norway. Switzerland has found more support uh, and they, they, launch, they have launched the pilot project there in Switzerland. We want a country that is rich, cold and uh, politically stable. Uh, and those are two good candidates. 
But Rutgers is very involved in creating awareness, education programs globally, and transfer of technology and promoting research globally. So we have annual global microbiome uh, workshops. The first one was in Peru uh, last year. Next January will be um, in Africa, three countries in Africa, and the next year in Indonesia. So these are big events with over a, a thousand participants um, that we are pursuing with Rutgers leading um, that effort. Thank you. Uh, Li Ping, the next question is for you. Knowing I have a child who received many antibiotics in childhood and now at age 30 struggles with weight gain, is it too late to restore? Uh, well, if uh, this is actually a question we are, we are working on. And uh, first we have examples like uh, the one which I showed you published a study we helped uh, patients, either young and uh, children, uh, young men, and they are morbidly obese and or even genetically obese and have overgrowth of pathogens and driving inflammation, probably also driving the uh, weight gain problem. And we can still uh, recover their healthier gut microbiome and help them lose a substantial amount of weight. And so it's possible to restore or repair and however, how difficult and uh, for a long-term sense, you can keep it off and how much effort uh, in terms of that, we, st we still need to, to work, but uh, at least partial restoration and repair is possible. Uh, thank you, Li Ping. And I'll just join in and say that whatever the case, it is probably easier to repair when children are younger because of the nature of development. Yes. Uh, and now we have a question for Debashish. Uh, how is global warming affecting the microbiomes of corals in different parts of the world? So what happens, um, what has generally been found, so the field of microbiomes in corals is actually is nascent. It's just starting to uh, take off now as these tools are being applied to corals more broadly. What has been found is that the microbiome in corals tends to be quite broad, uh, you know, in the in the in the juvenile stage when the when the corals first um, settle, and then there's a narrowing of that uh, of that microbiome over time. Uh, so it becomes suited to the particular environment and the particular sort of holobiont biology. What thermal stress does is that it actually it takes off this control and you get a more variability and you also get the rise of bacterial populations that are pathogenic. So that's, it's very, very similar to what has been described for the human system is that when you, when you create dysbiosis, that is you create an instability uh, within the holobiont, you lose this, this sort of more narrow controlled microbiome, you get a broad spectrum and you get much more recruitment from the environment. And you also get, for example, a vibrio Corallolithicus, which is one of the major pathogens, they tend to, to bloom. So there is a shift from a sort of healthy, narrow microbiome to a less controlled and to a shift towards a pathogenic microbiome. Thank you. We're, we're now going to have one last question for each person. Uh, uh, Debashis, we'll start with you. Um, here's the question. I scuba dive. Can I do something to help coral health? Is there something I shouldn't do when I'm diving? Yeah, so I, I, I thought about showing some images from Hawaii. So when you go to the Hawaii website or you go to a tourism site, you say, what's the best place to see corals? So then you go to those sites and you see that 90% of the corals have been destroyed because people have been stepping on them. There's been sand being put on them. So the, the, the pictures I showed you are from Kaneohe Bay, which is a protected area. So there is no tourism, no fishing, no boating around there. So the corals are beautiful and they represent more of the natural state. So the problem with, you know, with doing scuba diving and tourism is that it, it, it increases the awareness, but it also brings a lot of stress. So I think the most important thing in doing scuba diving in a coral rich area is to be very, very mindful. That is not to disrupt the corals and to do it in a sort of a, a low population frequency way, not to have a lot of people in the same place and not certainly not to leave anything in the water. What you can do in terms of uh, helping corals is that there is a number of programs in Florida, for example, and, and, and in other places where you can volunteer to take 
uh, corals from nurseries and put them out in the, you know, uh, 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 in the wild. The Moat Marine Lab is doing that. Uh, or you can also, you know, you can, uh, you can stay away from the most sort of sensitive coral areas. And, and, and unfortunately, that is the best solution for corals is that to be very, very careful when you're around them and, and to not overpopulate them because they are very, very sort of sensitive to this sort of activity. Right. Thank you. Uh, Li Ping, here's a question I know that you're going to like. Uh, Dr. Zhao, is recruitment for the family microbiome study limited to New Jersey? I recently re relocated to California, but I'm interested. Well, well uh, no, it's not limited to New Jersey residents. And uh, you're welcome to join. Great. Uh, uh, Gloria. Uh, what effect does biofilm formation in various niches like mouth, vagina, and gut have on the use of microbiome transplantation in attempting to restore a healthy microbiome? That's a very good question. We don't know the answer. Um, the restoration has, we, our trial uses vaginal fluids collected with a gauze. Um, there was one trial of fecal transplant from the mother to the newborn baby um, using putting maternal feces in the milk of the, the first milk of the baby. Both restore partially. More studies are needed because what we really want in the future is to be able to control the composition of, of that mix and uh, know well the probiotic and use the prebiotics to sustain Right. And the last question is directed to me. And the question is, did you characterize the mouse mother's fecal material to know what bacterial community has had the restorative effects? And that's an excellent question. Yes, that we have been working on that. We know that there is restoration and we have been cataloging what is in the mom's poop. We have found uh, microbes uh, present in the baby's poop that didn't originate in the babies that must have come from the moms. We have a list of candidate organisms uh, that are of interest and, and one by one, we're putting them into uh, test mice, into germ-free mice to see what effects they will have uh, uh, on, on a, a new generation of mouse. So this is, this is very basic research where we're painstakingly trying to identify the key organisms of the transplantation. And I think uh, we have other questions there. We have more questions than we have time to answer, but I think we'll have an opportunity to answer some of these questions uh, by, uh, by email or with the recording. So I'm gonna turn over the session back to uh, Brittany and Melissa, if, if you wanna uh, help uh, close the session. Thank you. What an incredible evening. Thank you, Dr. Dominguez Bello. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya. Thank you, Dr. Blazer, Dr. Zhao, and the Rutgers University Foundation special events team who organized this event. And a special thank you to all of you for attending tonight's Zoom. All of our contact information will be sent to you in a follow-up email, and we'll be in touch with you to see if you are interested in learning more about the topics presented. Have a good evening. <laughs>